Hey there everyone, welcome to Puppy Book Club. I'm Pup X, and today we'll be talking about Venus in Furs by Leopold Ritter von Sacher Massach, the man who gave his name to masochism. Born in 1836 in Galicia, a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that's now Eastern Ukraine, most of his early writing was focused on history and folklore. However, his most famous writing is focused on dominant women and the men who served them. Because of this, in 1886, psychologist Richard Freyer von Kraft Ebbing named sexual masochism after him, something that Massac was apparently not happy about. But the stories Massac wrote did mirror his real-life interests. For example, today's story, where a man and a woman from Austria travel to Italy so she can beat him. This matches an actual trip that he took to Venice with his mistress, Baroness Fanny Pister, at least according to the memoirs of his wife, Aurora. In 1896, Massac began work on The Legacy of Cain, a project he envisioned as a collection of novellas organized into six themes, love, property, state, war, work, and death. Intended to be a scathing overview of the evils of society, Massac abandoned the project in 1880 with only love, property, and a smattering of other stories from the other themes completed. It wasn't intended to be a standalone work. Each section would outline a societal ill, and then the final story would attempt to prescribe a solution. However, unless your German or French is very good, you'll be hard-pressed to find any of Massac's other writings that you can actually read. Venus in Furs is the only one that's widely available in English translation. So I, and most of you, will have to experience it on its own. Venus in Furs begins with a frame story. An unnamed narrator dreams of the titular goddess. He then meets with his friend Severin, tells him about the dream, and gets berated for his foolishness. By way of explanation, Severin directs him to his own memoir, Confessions of a Supersensual Man, which serves as the main story. The reason I'm glossing over the framing device like this is that Massant kind of front-loaded the point, stating a thesis and then telling a story as an example. Dream Venus and Severin both give long monologues on ideas that will be repeated, sometimes several times, in the main story. He did this so that we would be thinking about the things he wanted us to think about throughout the work, but I intend to do the opposite. Let's talk about the story and then come back to the point. There are a couple of things I'd like to pull forward from the frame story, though. The first of which is the question, why furs? It's in the title, and fur coats are all over the place in the work. So why is Venus wearing furs? There's the kink perspective, of course. Dominant women wearing furs is one of Massac's big fetishes. This is an idea of dominance linked to social class. Attire used as a signifier for a hierarchy we're already familiar with, reappropriated for the subdom hierarchy. Fur is expensive, and someone wearing lavish furs is presumed to be wealthy, noble, even regal, above you. You don't want to be dominated by a schmo peasant. You want an opulent goddess, resplendent in the finest dead animal goldens can buy. But there's something else going on here. In the dream, our narrator comments on the fine spring weather and listen to Venus's reply. I'm going to pull out and actually read directly from the script for this. Pretend it's the book. Uh. Much obliged for your spring, she says, and afterwards sneezed divinely. Our Mediterranean goddess thinks that Germany is too yiffing cold. She has a whole monologue about this, but we'll leave it at that for now. The other thing I'd like to make note of is this word supersensual. 
Severin uses it several times to describe himself in the story, and it refers to heightened feelings. Feelings that are more intense than that of a normal person, describing someone who is capable of feeling such things. As a suprasensual man, Severin defines himself as being constantly awash in uncontrollable feelings, at least during the time of his life represented by the memoir. With those two points out of the way, we're ready to leave the frame story behind for now and delve in to Venus in furs. Severin is staying at a health resort in the Carpathians, a place of leisure where he hopes to work on his art. During his stay, he becomes enamored with a statue of Venus sitting in the courtyard. He describes his love as mad, madly as one can only love a woman who only responds to our love with an eternally strong smile. He continually returns to the statue on his many walks and continually fails to write poetry devoted to it. Around this time, Severin also comes into possession of a reproduction of a particular painting, Venus with a Mirror by Titian. Severin declares that this is his ideal, and writes a few lines on the back dedicated to the goddess and her despotic furs, alongside the heading, Venus in Furs. One day, he goes for his normal walk to discover the statue of Venus draped in a heavy fur coat. This sudden, improbable realization of his fantasy throws him into a wild panic, and he flees from the statue but it starts his relationship with another tenant of the health resort, Wanda von Duneyev. She placed the coat there as a little joke after noticing his pattern of visiting the statue and somehow seeing the notes he wrote on the back of the painting. Severin refers to what follows as an acquaintance, but it's clear from the outset that he idolizes her. After conversing with her for several days, he finally writes his first complete poem, which begins like this, reading from the script again, because it's the book. The script is secretly the book. Place thy foot upon thy slave, O thou, half of hell, half of dreams, and so on. This poem is also titled Venus in Furs, drawing a clear connection between Severin's view of Wanda and his ideal born of paintings and statuary. The two start up a friendship consisting mostly of long conversations regarding art and philosophy. Neither Wanda nor Severin see much of worth in what they consider the values of their society. Wanda derides Christian marriage, which at the time in Austria entailed the woman basically becoming property of her husband, and instead prefers a hedonistic lifestyle. I am young, rich, and beautiful, and I live serenely for the sake of pleasure and enjoyment. Severin also desires a life of pure sensuality, justifying it by ascribing that ideal to the classical Greeks, which he, like everyone else in Europe at the time, idolized. And it is while discussing the Greeks that Severin points out that their serene lives, as he imagines them, were only possible because they owned slaves, a pivotal turning point in the content of the pair's conversations. Wanda vacillates quite a bit between finding this concept fascinating and wanting nothing to do with it. She states that she has a real talent for despotism, but storms away in anger at one point when Severin kneels before her. Severin himself alternates wildly in what he wants from his relationship with Wanda, asking her to marry him and pleading with her to be cruel to him. Severin quickly becomes so obsessed with Wanda that he will do whatever will give her pleasure, declaring, make of me your husband or your slave. His passion for her will permit only one or the other. 
Wanda does not consider Severin husband material. She would want a husband who, in her words, could completely subjugate her. She even says that she doesn't think she could love a man for longer than one year. However, Wanda does admit that she would find it interesting to have a slave. I shall not lack for pastime. I shall make a plaything for myself out of you. She is still hesitant, wondering if she could really mistreat someone who loves her. And when it comes time for her to try it out with a recently purchased whip, she says, If I were really the woman who beat her slaves, you would be horrified. But Severin begs her to beat him. And so... The blows fell rapidly and powerfully on my back and arms. Each one cut into my flesh and burned there, but the pains enraptured me. Note for the record that while Wanda may be holding the whip, Severin is the one that's really calling the shots here. It's his fantasy. And as fascinated as she is by it, saying afterwards that she was tempted to test his strength, she's also frightened and overwhelmed. For a little while after this, Wanda doesn't permit any talk of slavery or cruelty, and the only thing she does for Severin's benefit is wear her furs. This doesn't last long, however. Wanda is visited by a friend, a married woman with many lovers. And this leads to two things. Plot-wise, Severin professes his fear of losing Wanda to another man, which leads to what happens next. But Wanda, in defending her friend's behavior, gives us this gem. No woman is so good or so bad, but that at any moment she is capable of the most diabolical as well as the most divine, of the filthiest, as well as of the purest thoughts, emotions, and actions. This is presented as a profound statement on the nature of women, even though it's really true of everyone. It's also Masak's answer to the Madonna whore complex. Wanda is telling Severin to stop seeing women as either wholly virtuous or wholly immoral, although from what we see in the rest of the story, I don't think he quite gets the message. After this, they go into the planning phase. Something about this exchange has reawakened Wanda's willingness to take Severin as a slave. The pair make plans to travel to Florence so they can be anonymous, and Wanda draws up a contract for the two of them to sign when they get there. Contracts are an interesting aspect of BDSM. They're not remotely legally binding. In fact, Wanda and Severin are intentionally going someplace where slavery was illegal by the 1860s to have their master-slave dynamic. But many people find them useful for delineating roles, rights, and responsibilities in a complex power exchange dynamic. In this case, Severin will act as Wanda's servant and take on a name of her choosing, while Wanda agrees to wear her furs as often as possible, especially when she is feeling despotic. The pair set out by train to Italy, Severin riding in third class and taking on the name Gregor, apparently a stereotypical servant name for the place and time, a 19th century Austrian Jeeves. He waits on Wanda throughout the journey. She even laughs at him as he struggles with her luggage. It must be heavy. It has all my furs in it. After a night in a Florentine hotel, where Wanda refuses to eat in the same room as Severin, makes him sleep in an unheated room, and hits him when he uses her real name instead of calling her mistress, Wanda declares that his service has satisfied her. She buys a villa where the two of them will live, and pulls out the unsigned contract. The audition is over. It's time to get serious. 
There has been an addition. Wanda is asking not just for the right to treat Severin as her slave and torture him, but for the right to kill him if the mood strikes her. Now, this contract isn't remotely enforceable, but if you can see the looming problems here, give yourself a cookie. Uh, you're going to need it. As Severin signs this new contract, he looks up, and on the ceiling is a painting of Samson and Delilah, a biblical story of a man betrayed by his love for a woman. Masak is not even trying to be subtle here. Immediately after the contract is signed, Wanda calls in a trio of other servants to tie Severin up so she can whip him. This group is interesting. Three black women that Wanda has hired at some point in their few days of being in Italy. They are treated as extensions of Wanda, preparing Severin several times when she wants to whip him, and even being cruel to him themselves. They amused themselves, sticking me with their golden hair needles. These women are emblematic of how far down the social hierarchy Severin has placed himself. Were it not for the contract, these women would be at the bottom of the food chain in the villa. Instead, they assist Wanda in tormenting her slave. At around the same time in the story, we see some reminders that Wanda is technically Severin's social inferior as a woman. After she disciplines him for spilling something, he observes, A slap in the face is more instructive than ten lectures especially when instruction is by way of a small woman's hand. There's a connection being made here. Two societal scripts, one gendered, one racial, being flipped on their heads. Wanda clearly enjoys taking advantage of her new upward social mobility. In addition to whipping him, she mandates long periods of time where Severin is not permitted to see her, instead working in the garden. Almost all of Severin's time is spent pining for Wanda or serving her. Wanda even pretends that she's taken on other lovers because she knows this will cause Severin the most anguish of all. There are a few moments where the fantasy is dropped and the two take a break from their roles, but it feels very unbalanced. During the silent periods, Severin wonders if Wanda has forgotten about him, and he has nightmares where she takes the form of a ravenous bear or an executioner with a guillotine. After one punishment where Severin is locked in the basement, he even wonders if he hates her, but all that doubt melts away the second he's in her presence again. This goes on for some months, and then... Severin gets a mirror of himself. Wanda hires a young German painter who falls in love with her. Severin watches this infatuation grow with some pity. The poor fellow is an almost bigger ass than I am. The translation I have uses the word donkey for some reason. Anyway. The man paints several portraits of Wanda, and then she asks him to paint her using Severin as a footrest. It is during the creation of this painting that we get the following exchange. Your face has lost the expression which I need for my picture. Wait a moment. She rose and dealt me a blow with the whip. While whipping me, Wanda's face acquired more and more of the cruel, contemptuous character. Is this the expression you need for your picture? It is the expression, but I can't paint now. Perhaps I can help? Yes, cried the German, as if taken with madness. Whip me too. Whip me to death. <laughs> That's so extra. <laughs> so extra. Wanda proceeds to tie up the painter and beat him until he says he's ready to continue. Severin watches this with fascination, but from the outside we can see that this really is a one-sided need, presented as 
kind of pathetic. She openly states that she does not love him. All she wants from him is to finish the painting. And this matches a conversation that she and Severin have not long before this. Wanda tells Severin that she no longer loves him and is ready to end the contract whenever he wishes. In the land of good decisions, this would be the time to end things, but they do not do that. And the worst decisions of all are just around the corner. On a ride through the city, Wanda sees a man like never yet seen among the living, whose image completely enraptures her. I have no idea how to react to this person, and neither does Severin. The initial description includes the sentence, if his hips were less narrow, one might take him for a woman in disguise. Okay. And later, when Severin is collecting gossip, well... In Paris, he first appeared in women's dress, and the men assailed him with love letters. An Italian singer even invaded his home, and lying on his knees before him threatened to commit suicide if he wouldn't be his. I'm sorry, he replied, smiling. You will have to carry out your threat, for I am a man. I... What? <laughs> what? Uh, I, I, honey, listen. I know you're living in a pre-HRT world, but this is not a good coping mechanism. <sighs> this is Alexis Papadopoulos, former soldier, educated in Paris, atheist cruel by all accounts, and single. Wanda is immediately taken with him and commands Severin to find out as much information about him as possible, who he is, where he'll be, and when. And Severin is also entranced, calling him a masculine Eros. He is a man who is like a woman. He knows that he is beautiful, and he acts accordingly. Note that Alexis also habitually wears furs, and when Wanda goes to meet him at the theater, he even bosses Severin around like a servant, telling him to take his fur coat. I obey his call against my own will. Wanda quickly becomes a submissive to this dumb chevalier d'un. Only a single scene later, Possibly the next day, we see Severin serving both of them while Wanda sits at Alexis's feet. He is telling her about how when a lioness's mate is slain by another male, she will simply watch the battle and follow the victor. At this moment, my lioness looked quickly and curiously at me. Subtle. Severin goes to Wanda when she is alone and demands to know if she still loves him or if this new man is replacing him. She acknowledges that, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Wanda wants Alexis to subjugate her, which, she has already stated, is her primary criteria for a husband. Severin freaks out completely threatening to kill himself if Wanda abandons him. Her response? Do as you please, just let me go to sleep. The next morning, he decides to leave. Wanda has already stated that she's willing to let him leave, but he doesn't say anything to her, instead making his way to the train station and leaving behind a letter for her to read after he's gone. The problem is that Severin was dependent on his family for money at the health resort, and he didn't bring any with him to Florence, so he stuck. He also starts to feel that his actions are a betrayal of his oath from the second he leaves the villa. He doesn't even make it to the train station. Not wanting to go back to Wanda and 
unable to leave, Severin walks into the river Arno. And right back out again. This is a good time to remember that water is a pretty common metaphor for freedom. Think Edna from The Awakening walking into the sea to escape the confines of her society. Severin explicitly rejects this freedom. He returns to Wanda not to ask her to release him, but hoping that she will follow through with killing him herself, as she said she might in the contract. He is not willing to take back control over his life, even to end it, and he's not willing to interact with Wanda as anything other than as her dutiful slave. Wanda refuses to kill Severin, and she tries to give him the money for a train ticket, but he tells her that he can't leave. Severin languishes for some time in the garden, alone. Then he and Wanda have one final conversation. She tells him that Alexis is her master now, and she feels about him the same way that Severin has felt about her, and that he will not permit her to have a slave of her own, even if she still wanted one. Severin throws another fit. I shall kill you if you marry him. You are mine, and I won't let you go. And then he hits her. Wanda's response is actually positive, and she says that if he behaves like this, she would be willing to marry him. This is a lie. After they make their preparations to leave, Wanda convinces Severin to let her whip him one last time. As soon as he is tied up, Wanda tells him the story of the brazen bull, which she calls the Ox of Dionysus, a torture and execution device whose first victim, according to legend, was its own creator, saying that now Severin will be the victim of his own creation. Then Alexis comes in, who is perplexed and overjoyed to be told by Wanda that he can whip Severin if he wants. So that happens. Severin is miserable the whole time, and afterwards, Alexis and Wanda just leave. At some point, Severin becomes untied and makes his own way home, now proclaiming himself to be cured of his affliction of supersensuality. Severin returns to his father's estate to work, which he says he finds comforting, and after two years he inherits the land. I went on living just as rationally as if the old man were standing behind me. He has come back from decadent Italy to good, honest labor in the literal fatherland. Then we return to our frame story, with the nameless narrator asking Severin what the moral is. So let's try to answer that. The first concept we're working with is that the Germans, at least in the 19th century, do not know how to love. Dream Venus states this explicitly in her long monologue about the weather from the beginning, and Wanda and Severin have to leave Austria for the Mediterranean domain of Venus in Italy to pursue their relationship. It's easy to read this story as Severin coming to his senses after a descent into decadence, except that things aren't really better when he gets back. In the frame story, he is married and he yells at and threatens to beat his wife in front of his guest. Our narrator is appalled. We're not supposed to see this new life as the correct way of living. This is the norm that Severin and Wanda return to, but it is also the Christian marriage that Wanda had seen as undesirable, an anathema that drove her into exploring Severin's fantasy as an alternative. Wanda leaving Severin for Alexis is also part of this. While he embodies many of the things that both see as virtues, as a pagan decadent, he is also not German, but Greek, 
of Venus's domain. Wanda says of him, he is a man like a lion, strong and beautiful, and yet gentle, not brutal like the men of our northern world. Although, he is pretty brutal. Either this is an informed character trait, told not shown, or a genuine perception of Wanda that is broken as part of the narrative. It could be argued either way. Severin, the German who does not know how to love, is pretty heavily singled out as being to blame for what happens and his own suffering. Wanda is constantly talking about how he has awakened this uncontrollable urge in her that he is making her dangerous. The narrative doesn't hold her accountable for her unwillingness to put checks on herself. It's just the inherent nature of women to have no self-control, apparently. But it's obvious that Severin only wants one thing from Wanda, for her to be his mistress and be cruel to him. Honestly, he doesn't even really want her. What he wants is the statue from the health resort. He constantly compares Wanda to artwork, talking about her cold, marble-like body. She is not his Venus, but his Galatea, brought to life to realize his fantasy of serving her. Ultimately, Masak is telling a story about the broken gender relations of his time, positing that the shocking perversion of his characters and the norms of marriage are the same. Wanda can subjugate or be subjugated. The two are equal for her. Of the relations between men and women, Severin states, She can only be his slave or his despot, never his companion. This she can become only when she has the same rights as he, and is his equal in education and work. This is the last sentence in the novella. And really, if they could have approached each other as equals without Severin objectifying Wanda or her trying to manage the restrictive expectations on women, they could have managed the whole whipping thing without it going so very badly. So there you have it. Filth with a message. I want to thank everyone for watching, and if you liked this video, you should do the things. You know what the things are, because you are such smart puppies. Yes, you are smart puppies. Who's a smart puppy? It's you. Yes, it is. <gasps> yes, it is. Oh, good puppies. Good puppies. She states that she has a real talent for despotism. Jazz hands. Despotism jazz hands. I'm not sure what I'm doing there. So. <laughs>